This talk is every, because everybody's working. And one of the realities, of course, is that we know that the, our lives are going to be spent working. In fact, um, they have done research. The average American works roughly 90,000 hours of their entire life. That what you can expect for the rest of your life is working roughly 90,000 hours, the average American, which is just over half of your waking life is going to be spent at work. You guys don't seem to be happy about this, um, which I, I get because, I mean, they even talk about the 40-hour work week. I don't know if you know this, but 86%, even, you know, it's 40-hour work week. 86% of American men work more than 40 hours a week, and 66% of American women work over 40 hours a week. We work a lot, even though since 19, th these are the stats to get you involved, okay? So, um, so you're like, he knows what he's talking about. He's cited some statistics. So... Even though since 1950, the average American has increased their productivity by over 400%. So since 1950, we're working even more because in 1960, only 20% of the American families had both moms and dads at work. And right now, there's over 70% of American families having both moms and dads, not at work just because they want to, but work because they feel like they need to. We <laughs> spend a lot of our lives working. And we're not the only ones. In, in Japan, they have over 10,000 people die annually due to overwork. 10,000 people every year in Japan die from work. It's, it's actually, they, they die so often that there's actually even a Japanese term. They, it's called karoshi because it happens so often. No, that's tragic and sad. But did you know that the average American works over 135 hours per year more than the average Japanese person? In the country where they have 10,000 people a year die of overwork, they have this term, karoshi, the average American works over 135 hours more than the average Japanese person. But wait, it gets worse. <laughs> the average American will work over 260 more hours per year than the average person in the UK. And this is the worst one. I just think it's just so devastating. The average American will work over 300, sorry, over 499 hours per year more than the average French worker. 499 hours per year than the average French person. You know what that is? That's over, that's over three weeks of 24-hour days that you'll be working that the average French person is going to be eating their baguettes and their brie and like down at the beach in, in Nice, like the, three weeks every single year. And yet, they did a research, they did a study back, I think, in 2000, 2016, and only 10% of Americans said that they were even engaged with their work. Only 10% feel that they were engaged by their work. There was another 60% uh, that said they tolerated their work. And 30% of Americans said they absolutely hated their work. They hated their job. This thing, the thing that they're gonna spend doing, the, the, the half, over half of their waking life, they're gonna spend doing, 30% openly hate their work. So what do we do? How do, how do we approach work? Because I think a lot of us, we might approach work like, like that. We say like, oh my gosh, this is the thing that once I graduate, there I go. I'm going to work for the next however many years until I maybe hopefully get to retire. And then maybe if I have something saved up, I can actually start living my life. Is that a Christian view of work? In fact, I think for many of us, many Christians even, we can look at work and think like work is just a curse. Work is what happens as a result of the fall. If we were thinking that, we would actually be more, we'd be less Christian and more pagan. So the pagan idea of work, right, is the Greco-Roman idea, vision, even the Eastern, Middle Eastern vision of work was this, was that work was invented by the gods because the gods didn't want to do it, so they just invented human beings to be slaves. That was it. That's why, they're, that's why, that's not only why work exists, that's why you exist. Human beings exist to simply be slaves for the gods because the gods have so much better things to be doing than work. Question. Is that the Christian view of work? The answer, of course, is absolutely not. In fact, the Christian view of work goes all the way back to the Judeo vision of work, which is in Genesis chapter 1. What happens in Genesis chapter 1 
We don't see the God creating human beings to do work that he didn't want to do. What we, the, first, the, first act, the first picture of God we get is what? God is a... Sorry. Read my mind, you guys. You can't you finish my sentences. God is a worker. On the first day, God created. He built something. On the second day, God created. He did something. On the third day, he creates. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. The Judeo-Christian vision of God is not that God creates human beings to be his slaves because he didn't want to do work. The Judeo-Christian vision of God is that at his heart, God is a worker. And who here is made in God's image and likeness? A couple of you, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so that God makes us in his image and likeness, that means that just as God is a worker, you're made to work. In fact, what's the first commandment? The very first commandment that God gives to human beings is cultivate and care for this garden. He puts them in the garden, right? And he says, okay, cultivate and care for the garden. Basically, he's saying, go to work. Cultivate and care. Actually, those are two Hebrew terms. The two Hebrew terms are abodah and shamar. To work and to guard. That's what those two words mean. Abodah and Shamar are these two words, to work and to guard. And even before the fall, God says, here's what I've made you to do in the garden. I need you to Abodah and Shamar. I need you to work and to guard. What that should remind us of is that in the beginning, work is not a curse. In the beginning, in fact, in the beginning, you're made for work. If you're made in God's image and likeness, that means you are made. I, in fact, I'll say it more like this. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 reveals that we're made for three things. We're made for labor. We're made for leisure. We're made for love. We're made for these three things. We're made for labor, for leisure, and for love. These are three ways we get to actually exercise the fact that we've made in God's image and likeness. The horrible thing is that, as we know, um, in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, here's God who's good, makes this world good, makes you and I, like him, good. Everything's good. And if that was the end of the Bible, if Genesis chapter 2 was the end of the Bible, the Bible in the year would be very much shorter. But also, it'd be great. We know the Bible doesn't end with chapter 2. It goes on to chapter 3. And what happens in chapter 3 is there's the fall. And in Genesis chapter 3, the fall twists these three good things that you're made for. It twists labor, it twists leisure, and it twists love in a way that actually is devastating to all of us. If you think about this, um, how, how, is, how is leisure twisted? Well, what's your experience of leisure? What's my experience of leisure is either, it's one of these two extremes, or either our experience of leisure is, um, I don't know how to do it, right? So I just like, oh, I have some time off. Let me just scroll. How many times have you gotten done scrolling or binging on something and been like, wow, I feel so rejuvenated. That was recreation. Like, no, never. We don't know how to leisure. That's crazy. On the other hand, what, what's our other vision of leisure? Our other vision of leisure is just collapse. Like, I'm, I, maybe this happened to you like two weeks ago. <laughs> I got done with finals and it was just like, get me home. I can make it. Hi, mom and dad. Pfft, like that, that was it. <laughs> so, see, this twisted vision of the thing you're made for, you're made for leisure, this recreation, and yet we either don't do it right or we just simply collapse. The other, I mean, Love has been twisted, duh. Where we either are indifferent to others or we lust after them, right? We either ignore others or we use them. There's a bunch more talks on that throughout the course of this week, so I'm not going to dive into that anymore. But see this twisting of leisure, this twisting of love, and there's also this twisting of labor. So that either labor is merely toil It's fruitless, it's meaningless, or it's what gives us our identity. It's everything. This is who I am. In fact, Genesis chapter 3, we're going to hover over there for just a second here. In Genesis 3, what does God say? He says, from now on, to the man, you will toil. Toil is a fun word. Not only fun to say, just toil. There's kind of two syllables in it, but there's not really at the same time. Just you guys, toil. Isn't it kind of fun to say? Okay, anyway, <laughs> that was not in my notes. I just kind of got the feel in the spirit, you know? Um, but, there, but there's either work is toil or it's my everything. Either it's 
fruitless and it's pointless or it's my identity. And think about this, okay, just to hover over toil for a second. Toil is work that feels fruitless. And I know you've, you've been in that situation, right, where, where you've tried so hard and there's nothing. Like, whether that's like you, you study, you're taking that, that like, um, organic chem class, and you're just like, I am studying this so much in this physics class. And like, I'm putting so much time into this, and there is, the, 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 the what is this, is? what is this? The needle, the needle has not, I'm like, the needle has not changed at all. Like, I've been putting so much time into this, and there's no fruit from it. You've all experienced this, amen? Or even that sense of, like, maybe you're someone who, like, leads a Bible study. Maybe you're someone who's been inviting your friends to Mass. You're like, I just keep trying. I keep inviting people. And they say, sure. Or they never respond to my texts. And it seems so fruitless. Toil is work that it seems like it does nothing. Or it feels pointless. Or you show up and it feels seems like it does nothing. It seems like it means nothing. So fruitless means it's work that seems like it does nothing. Pointless is work that seems like it means nothing. I remember the first time I ever heard the term busy work. Because I, 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 I kind of came from a, a place where I just kind of trusted all my teachers that if they assigned me something to do, I'd be like, oh, this must be worthwhile. And we were talking to students who were like, this is just a bunch of busy work. Like, what? What is that? What is busy work? Well, busy work, well, you don't have to meet, you don't need me to describe it, but busy work essentially is that work that we, appears to us to be simply toil, right? It means nothing. It is pointless. And I could spend all my time doing this, and it ultimately will mean absolutely nothing. So how do we look at work? Is it merely toil? Is it merely fruitless and pointless? Or is there some work that actually can mean something? So, so to look into this, I just want to, we realize, okay, so leisure has been twisted, labor has been twisted, love has been twisted. And yet at the same time, going back to relationships, there are certain kinds of relationships, they're not necessarily the best, but they're still good. Just like there's kind of work that's not necessarily the best, but it's still good. So, okay, keep this in mind. There are such things, as you know, of, as toxic relationships, right? There's some relationships you just, no, you, they don't deserve your heart. They don't deserve your time. You should get out of those things. Those are such a thing as toxic relationships, just like there's some work, work that is dehumanizing. There is some work that actually strips you of your humanity, and you stay away from that. It's slavish work. You're not made to be a slave. Slavish work can strip you of your humanity. So just like toxic relationships, stay away from them. There's slavish work. You don't need to spend that time. But there's other kinds of work. I mean, think about the relationships. I mean, there are useful relationships. Has anyone here ever read the book by Dr. Sri, Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love? A couple of you. Yeah, so I recommend it highly. In it, he talks about different kinds of relationships. One of the kinds of relationships we have are useful friendships, useful relationships. That's like people, you're on the same team as each other, and you realize, yeah, we're close. Because why? Because we're going to work together to accomplish a goal. That's our friendship. Our friend, it's not bad. It's good. It's just useful. You're in the same study group. Why? Because it helps us all get a better grade. We're not going to study together. We're not going to spend time with each other if we're not going to help each other. No, again, it's not bad, but it simply is a useful friendship. Just like there's some work that is like, we have to do it because we have to do it. The uh, sewer is backed up. Someone has better fix that. That is work that just needs to get done. It's useful work. Or even... Work, work that pays the bills. That's useful work. That's not a bad work. That's not bad at all. It's like, okay, no, I'm doing this job. Why? Because it's good to do or it's worthwhile to do. It needs to get done or because it simply pays the bills. I have a brother-in-law who um, years ago he had this job that all he would do from eight o'clock in the morning to four o'clock at night with a hour, half hour lunch break was he would just do data entry for an insurance company. He would sit at the computer and just look at the file and like type it into a computer. I'm like, oh my gosh, Tanner, that must be awful. He's like, no, I love it. It's like, no one talks to me all day, <laughs> kind of an introvert. No one talks to me all day. And at 4 o'clock, at 4.01, I get to turn, down that, turn off that computer. I do not have to think about work until the next day at 8 a.m. Perfect. It pays the bills. Useful work. Not a bad thing, but a certain kind of thing. Amen? So there is toxic relationships, slavish work. There's useful relationships, useful work. There's also pleasant friendships. These are people that basically... You're with them because why? We have fun. They make me laugh. I make them laugh. We have fun. If we ever get deep, it doesn't really ever get deep. It doesn't need to get deep. This is simply a pleasant relationship. This is a fun friendship. That's not bad. It's good, but it's a certain kind. 
just like there are certain work, there are certain jobs that, no, this doesn't need to get done, this isn't paying the bills. Why are you doing this work? Because it's fun. I spent 10 summers of my life as a camp counselor. Not because they pay camp counselors a lot of money. In fact, um, I think we did, the, we did the math, the other counselors and myself. We, we, we earned something like 22 cents for, per hour. So unless you're independently wealthy, it's like not, not going to be something you necessarily get to do. But it was simply a fun job. I did the work because I found it enjoyable. So there's toxic relationships, slavish work. Useful relationships, useful work. There are pleasant friendships, and there's also pleasant work. But there's also this thing called virtuous friendships. These are friendships that make you better, and they make the other person a better person. And in the same way, there's work, some kind of work, that is meaningful work. And in fact, you say it like this, it's human work, not just useful, not just fun, but what some science, social scientists have called connected work. So we, we live in a culture right now that has divorced what you're doing in your work from the end. That we've kind of fragmentized our world. And so, I mean, think about this. If you were someone working 100, 200 years ago on a farm, you were part of that entire process from, we're gonna till the ground, we're gonna prepare the land, we're gonna seed the land, we're gonna water and grow the land, we're gonna harvest the crops. You were part of the whole thing. Now, what do you do? I mean, somebody, I just, I punch these numbers and that's it, I pass them on to the next person. I put, do this number and I pass it on to the next person. I do this, we fragmented our lives so much. We don't have human work because we don't have connected work. But human work is connected work. In fact, there are some social scientists who have talked about this. They said, they said, for human work to really be human work, it needs to involve three things. One, it needs to have a meaningful goal. Secondly, there needs to be some kind of purpose behind it. And third, every worker needs to be able to make decisions that actually matter. So these three things. So it needs to be connected to a goal. It needs to have some kind of purpose behind it. And you need to feel like you can make decisions that actually make a difference. So, some examples. Um, there were a group of people who, their job was to call alumni from a university and ask them for money. So, here's the thing. You're going to graduate with a mortgage called your tuition. Um, and, and then after you pay that off, or even sometimes while you're paying that off, you will have some people who are at the university who are calling you saying, hey, I know that you're paying us this amount of money every single month, but would you be willing to give us even more money so that we can da da da, right? So these are the people, their job is to call alumni and raise money. Well, they found that if they would, if they, before they make the call, they would invite a student and a current student who would give their testimony, and the story would be, I would not be able to attend this university if it weren't for the scholarships that I've received from this university. These scholarships are made possible because there are alumni that are willing to support me being here. And if they simply had that current student come in and give their testimony about, this is what it means for me to be able to go to school, is if there are people who are willing to support the scholarship that I can get paid, they found that if they've heard that one testimony before they make a call, that the productivity of that call, the amount of money that they will raise, is increases by 170%. Why? Because it's connected to a goal. It's not just I'm randomly calling a number and asking someone if they want to support university of whatever. It's I'm asking someone, are you willing to help this person who would not able, be able to be a, to attend this university to be able to attend this university? Amen? So has to be a te so meaningful work, connected work, human work has to be connected to a goal. Secondly, there's gotta be some kind of meaning behind it, some kind of purpose. In fact, there was a, a hospital I heard about, and this hospital were so united in their mission to help people get better, to help sick people get better, that even the janitors were invited in on this mission. Not just in theory, but in practice. How they ran this hospital was if there was a janitor and they were in the area, and a nurse or a doctor, physician assistant, someone take caring for a patient needed help, that the janitors had agreed. Like, you just ask me, I'll run into the room, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Grab this, help this, because the janitors said, like, yeah, yes, for the most of the day, I clean these rooms. Most of the day, I just I pick up the mess. But this work is purposeful, this work is meaningful, 
because they say, I'm here to help sick people get better. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help sick people get better. So human work is connected work, right? So it has a goal. Secondly, there's meaning. And thirdly, it has some autonomy. Like you have the ability to make decisions. In fact, last little story before we move on to the next thing is, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain. Um, at one point, the Ritz-Carlton, I read about this, they had given every one of their employees the ability to use up to $2,000 of discretionary funds to solve any guest's problem. So if you're at the front, you're working at the front desk, and uh, there's a guest who comes up and says, I have an issue, um, I didn't get this on this flight, can you help me out? Rather than say, I'm so sorry you didn't get on this flight, um, good luck, that the person at the desk can say, actually, how much is your flight, $500? No problem, we'll take care of that for you. Without having to consult anybody. They were entrusted, they were entrusted by the people who were in charge of the whole place to say, if you can make a guest's stay even more, even better, you can make a decision up to 2,000 degree dollars of discretionary income and not have to ask anyone for permission. That's how deeply we trust you. Imagine, imagine that kind of trust from the people who are employing you, to be able to say, wait a second, I actually get to make decisions that are part of this mission, part of this goal, that's meaningful, that actually helps people. That's human work. That's what it is to have, to do connected work. And it's so much more important. You know, Adam Smith, I know some of you are economics majors, some of you are history buffs, and you know who Adam Smith is, the father of modern economics. His thought was that human beings are so twisted, so fallen, so lazy, that the only way you can get us to do anything is if, if you incentivize us by paying us more. And you can get human beings to do anything provided that you give them enough money. That only goes so far. Because, of course, we all realize that what we all want is not money, we all want meaning. We need money, but we're made for meaning. And we know this, that when you have good work, you realize work is not a curse. It's not a result of the fall. Toil, pointless, fruitless work, that our experience of that can be the result of the fall. But not good work. So again, one of, the, one of the temptations is, as a result of the fall, work is simply toil, fruitless, pointless, or, or work is what gives me my identity. And this is one of those things that just, it's so interesting. I mean, empty work gives rise for the desire for work that allows me to be human. Makes sense. The more disconnected I feel from work, the more I, I need to do work that allows me to be human, that allows me to be me. But what happens is, and maybe this happened to you, I think it's happened to our culture, is that it's also given the rise to the desire for work that is me being me. I don't know if that makes any sense to you yet. Um, basically this, work that gives me my identity. Um, there's a man, his name is Robert Bella. Robert Bella wrote a book called Habits of the Heart way back in the day. And in it, he described this thing. So this isn't like a Gen Z thing. It's not a millennial thing. It's not a Gen X thing. This is way back for the boomers. Robert Bella wrote this book and he said, what's, what's happened in our culture is this rise of what he called expressive individualism. And expressive individualism is this thing of like, um, my work should simply be a reflection of myself. That my work should simply be an outgrowth of me, again, me being me in this world. And so I read this other column that talked about, you have heard of the term yuppie right? The yuppie back in the 1980s. Yuppies are people who just wanted to make money. And after the yuppies were hipsters, right? Hipsters are people who just want to be themselves. I just want to be me. This article talked about this next iteration. If the yuppie just wanted to make money and the hipster just wanted to be me, they use this term called the yucky. And the yucky was someone who wanted to make money by just being me. That kind of person who says, like, I, I'm, I'm so unique that I should be paid for simply being myself. I'm so unique that I should simply be paid for pursuing my passion. And that can happen. That, that is, that's something that can actually infect our thoughts. Just, hey, pursue your passion. Years ago, before Steve Jobs had died, he gave a commencement address at a university. And in the course of this university address, he said to all these college graduates, he said, listen, what you need to do is you, if you want to be happy, you need to pursue your passion. You need to find your passion and pursue your passion. How many of us have heard that? 
If you want to be happy, you need to find your passion and pursue your passion. There, there was a, it was fascinating. After this, there was another author, another, another reporter, who did an article on Steve Jobs and said, okay, well, that's interesting. We have all heard that. We all think that's true. And they asked the question, what if Steve Jobs had done that himself? Like, what if Steve Jobs, when he was in college, what if he pursued his passion? Would he be Steve Jobs? So they went back and looked at Steve Jobs' life. Steve Jobs' passion, back when he was in college age, was not electronics. It was Zen Buddhism. In fact, Steve Jobs was passionate about one thing, and that was Zen Buddhism. The reason why he actually worked with circuit boards and worked to design what ultimately became Apple was because he wanted to make money to simply pr pursue his pursuit of Buddhism even further. So if Steve Jobs had taken Steve Jobs' advice of find your passion and pursue your passion, we wouldn't have the computers we have. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't, this wouldn't exist. If Steve Jobs had taken his own advice of find your passion and pursue your passion. There's someone I think who's even wiser, and maybe this is my assessment, this is my opinion, complete opinion, someone wiser than Steve Jobs, his name is Mike Rowe. I don't know if you've heard of Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe had a, a TV show back in the day called Dirty Jobs. And in Dirty Jobs, what he would do, woo yeah, yeah, uh, I, I'm with you. And so what Mike Rowe would do is he, he would follow these people all around the country who were doing these jobs that no one else wanted, the dirty jobs, right? That people would think, I would never, ever do this. Over the course of the, I think, eight seasons that Dirty Jobs was on, he said he discovered some one thing in common with every person who's doing these dirty jobs. Number one, most of them were wildly successful. Number two, most of them were incredibly happy. And number three, none of them had a passion for what they were doing originally. None of them. None of them got into transporting liquid fertilizer, AKA animal feces across the country because they're like passionate about fertilizer. They just, what they did was they looked for an opportunity. They looked for an opportunity, they pursued the opportunity, they got good at it, and then they found a way to be happy. They did not pursue their passions. They looked for opportunity. They pursued the opportunity, they got really good at it, and they found a way to be happy. I know a family uh, based out of uh, Nebraska, and uh, woo I know, I know. Uh, and I was talking with this, this, this husband and wife, and they had, a, they had a, a, a company that basically made pet food. And they were very successful. They were very happy. And neither of them had a passion for like, I want to feed domesticated animals with <laughs> the fruit of the earth. It was like, oh, there's an opportunity. Let's pursue that. Let's get really good at it. Let's help people feed their pets. Wealth, happiness. Not pursue passion. Seek the opportunity. Pursue the opportunity. Get really good at it and find a way to be happy. Um, John Acorn. John Acorn is a leader in the field of positive psychology. And in his research, one of the things he discovered was that only 10% of human happiness is a result of external circumstances. Only 10% of our happiness on a daily basis is a result of external circumstances. My job, my relationship status, where I live, only 10% is based off of external circumstances. And yet, for so many of us, one of the things we try to control more than anything else is, oh my gosh, what kind of job will I have? Where will I live? Who will I marry? How many kids will we have? All these external circumstances, they're important, obviously. But only 10% of our happiness is based off of those external circumstances, which reveals something to us. It should reveal that you're in more control of your happiness than you might think. You have more control over your own happiness than you might think. And I don't think necessarily that we'll be happy by this, what Robert Bella called expressive individualism. The yucky, I get paid for being myself, but there's something more important, something more powerful. Robert Bella said this, and he wasn't even Christian. He said, it's a rediscovery of a thing called vocation. That if you actually want 
to have a fulfilled life. It's a rediscovery of something called vocation. We all heard, heard, we've all heard the term vocation. We typically think in the world, we think vocation is your job. In the church, we think vocation is one of the big four, right? Priesthood, religious life, concert, a single life, or marriage. But ultimately in Christian circles, vocation simply means I've been called out of myself by another. That's, that's basically what it is. To have a vocation means I've been called out of myself by another. So my work is my vocation, right? I, it's no longer where I get my identity. It's where I bring my identity. Your work is no longer where you get your identity. It's where you bring your identity. Again, just like Mike Rowe had said, it's not finding your passion. It's seeking the opportunity, pursuing the opportunity, getting good at it, and finding a way to be happy. Another way to say it is like this. It involves two steps. One is looking up, and then the second is looking in. Number one, looking up, hearing the call. What is the need of the world? And number two, looking in. Realizing that you already have a self. You already have a worth. You already have an identity. I think about Jesus. Before Jesus does any miracles, before he does any great thing, before Jesus does any of his mission to save the world, he gets baptized by John in the Jordan. And what does the Father say over him? He says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus doesn't get his identity. He doesn't get his worth for what he then goes on to do. He already has his identity. He already has his worth. Your work and my work is not about self-expression. It's about self-donation. It's not where I get my identity. It's where I get to give myself away. It's the vocation. Looking up and saying, okay, what does the world need? Looking in and saying, do I have what it takes to meet, meet that need? Do I have the ability to make that need? And do I want to? This is really important. Not only looking out and saying, okay, what does the world need? What's the opportunities? What are the oppor what is, what's the call? And looking in and saying, do I have the ability to reach that call, see a need, fill a need? It's also, do I want to? I remember hearing a story about Whitney, Whitney Houston back in the day when Whitney Houston was just a, a young girl. Uh, I think her godmother was Aretha Franklin. So kind of nice bloodline and nice people around. And Whitney Houston at one point said to her, her godmother Aretha, um, I want to be a singer. And Aretha Franklin said, oh, here's a question. Wait, you have to answer this. Do you want to be a singer or do you want to sing? Those are two different things. She said, if you want to sing, you have a great voice. You can sing every Sunday in the church choir. Every Tuesday, every Wednesday, we have praise and worship. You can sing. If you, want to be, if you want to sing, you can sing. If you want to be a singer, that doesn't just mean singing. It means being part of the industry. It means doing all the things, all the other things that no one wants to do when they want to sing. But if you want to be a singer, it's very different than just I want to sing. Same thing is true for all of us. I want to help people. Okay. Do you want to be someone who professionally does that for the whole course of your life? Or do you want to be someone who lives a certain way, and uses their free time to help others. I mean, that's just a bad example, but just like that sense of, I have to ask that question and answer that question. What is the need? I look up and then I look in. Do I have the ability and the desire to fulfill that need? And to do it without fear. There's this incredible movie back in the day called Chariots of Fire, which is super boring, just spoiler, super boring. If you're not, you don't run the 400 meter dash, you will be completely bored by this, by this movie. But there's two men in this movie. One is Harold Abrams, and one is Eric Little. Both of them are incredible, world-class 100 meter dash sprinters. And at one point, Harold Abrams, his character says, basically, yes, he says, it's, it's, it seems so unfair. 10 seconds to prove that my life means something. That's how we saw it. Seems so unfair. 10 seconds to prove my life means something. This might be some of us saying, are you kidding me? I get 40 years, 50 years to do some work that, that can show that I mean something, that, I, that my life is worth living. Harold Abrams said 10 seconds to prove my, that my life means something. He says, I'm not only afraid of losing, I'm afraid of winning. Because even if I win, who am I afterwards? A lot of you who are Student-athletes, you know this experience. A lot of you who are former student-athletes, you know this experience even more acutely. That, that sometimes it happens in that senior year where your sport was in the fall, 
And your whole identity has been like, yeah, I'm on the football team, I'm a football player, I play baseball, I play volleyball, whatever that sport is, and then all of a sudden it's done. And the second you step off the court for the last time, second you step off the field for the last time, it's not, I'm a football player, I'm a baseball player, I'm a basketball player, it's I used to be a, I used to swim in college, I used to be a runner, I used to do whatever in college, I used to, I'm not that anymore. I'm afraid, it seems so unfair. Contrasted with Eric Little, who not only was an incredible athlete, was also a Christian dedicated to Jesus Christ. Who himself, in the whole course of the story, he was the number one seed in the entire world for the 100-meter dash, but they ran the 100-meter uh, heats on a Sunday. And as a Christian, he said, I can't, his work was running, and so he's like, I can't work on Sunday. So he refused to do the 100-meter dash. Instead, instead, he moved to the 400. Spoiler, he wins the 400-meter dash. But the point is not that if you do what the Lord says, he'll give you the gold medal. That's not happened. That doesn't true. Look at the cross. But it is to say this difference. Eric Little knew who he was, whether he stepped on the track or not. Eric Little knew that who he was, his identity came from Jesus, so that even if he lost, he still won. Harold Abrams, his identity came from his work. So even if he won, he still lost. So, last couple things. Human work. Everything you do has dignity because you're doing it. That's why. Because you're a human being made in God's image and likeness. Because of that, everything you do has worth because you have worth. Again, if you ask the, ask the Greeks, if one of the gods became a human being, what kind of human being would they become? They would say he, that person would become a philosopher king. That's, that's what they saw as the highest. You ask the Romans, if, if one of the gods became a human being, what kind of human being would they become? They'd become a statesman because, yeah, they'd become an, involved in politics. They would, they would steer the course of the polity. Question, when God did become one of us, what was his job? He's a carpenter. He was a worker. What does that mean? Well, a couple things. Here's what it doesn't mean. Sometimes, if you want to picture Jesus and Joseph in a carpenter shop, like, you know, carving wood, kind of sitting back, like, in, it's all dusty and like there's wood particles in the air and, and Joseph's just kind of like carving like a little whatever, making a little boat, making a chair. That's fine, you can have that image. But the actual Greek word that is used in the Gospels for what Joseph was and what Jesus was as far as the occupation is the Greek word tekton, which can mean carpenter, but ultimately simply means laborer. And sometimes it's used to, to designate people who work with wood, but it's also used to designate people who work with stone. You know, when Jesus was growing up, about two to four miles away from Nazareth, there was a, a Greek city that was being built. And it's very likely, very possible, that Jesus' whole life growing up before he, between he, he was, when he was able to work and his 30, 30th year, he would get up every morning with Joseph and they would walk a couple miles to this other town. And what Jesus might have done all day is simply haul rocks from this place to that place all day. That's all he did. I'm not saying that's what the job was, but tecton means someone who would do that. Someone who did that, who simply hauled rocks all day is called a tecton. Jesus is called a tecton. What does that reveal to us? Not only that God not only starts out as a worker, he continues as a worker, it also reveals there's no such thing as work that's beneath you. If that's how Jesus, the Savior, the Lord of all, that's how he spends his time, the majority of his awake hours, simply hauling rocks. There is literally no such thing as work that's beneath you. Because every kind of work you do, every kind of work I do, is human work. Again, work is not where we express ourselves, it's where we give ourselves. Because work is not just about what you do, it's about who you become. That's why, again, this phrase, busy work. I get it, I don't like it. I don't think there's such a thing as busy work. I don't think there's such a thing as, yes, there is work that's like, this isn't, isn't doing anything, but it is, it is. It's doing something in you. It's doing something in me. So my senior year, I guess getting bored. Are you guys okay? Are you guys okay? Should I keep going or should I stop? 
stop. Okay, just, just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. Okay, okay. So um, my senior year in college, I, I majored in theology. And I had this class, I, 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 apparently I missed it. It was a freshman class. I didn't take it. It was a it was class basically for someone who needed a theology credit and I hadn't taken it yet. So I signed up, took, showed up the first day, the very first day of class, it was packed. I literally had to sit on the ground because so many people had shown up for this class. And I remember thinking, I've never heard of this professor. This is, he must be awesome, he must be incredible. The second day of class, no one was there. There was a handful of people because I realized then what everyone knew was this teacher, this professor, his class was so easy, you didn't have to show up for class once. You just had to show up, they showed up the first day to get when the tests are being given. Show up on test day, you'll get an A. That's all it was. But I'm the kind of person who like shows up because I feel compelled. And so <laughs> I showed up for every class and he was the worst teacher I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, so bad, so bad. And, and also not only was he a bad teacher, like there was nothing worthwhile that he ever taught out loud in public with his voice, but also there was this group of guys who did show up every day for class. I don't know why they showed up because they talked all through class, like literally, not like mur, 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 mur. They were like, we're having an open conversation normally. And I'd be looking over and kind of be that person like, After one of these classes, I remember I was going to go up to talk to the, he was a monk, he was a priest, and I was going to say, Father, just please, the girl ahead of me was saying the same thing. So I was like, okay, I don't have to say anything. And he said, I shouldn't have to say anything. This isn't kindergarten. I shouldn't have to tell them to not be, not talk during class. I'm like, yeah, but you do, you know, kind of a, so there were times, and I, I'm sorry about this, I have to confess this. There were times, he was a very slight man, a very small human being, and in his habit, it was very even smaller kind of thing. I remember I had these like rage daydreams of like walking up to him and like grabbing him by the side, like picking him up and like breaking him. And it was just, I was so, I was just, again, I'm sorry. I brought it to confession. It's okay. We're good. But there was this, I was so, so angry at him. And yet every time I looked at him with disgust. Every time I rolled my eyes, every time I just kind of like, whatever, he'd always meet me with patience. He always met me with just this peace. He took my negative attitude and every time I offered this negativity, he was just like, I'm open to you. He didn't teach me a thing about theology. He did teach me about how to be Jesus. He didn't teach me, he didn't teach me a what, he didn't teach me a single, single what, but he taught me what a good who looks like. That's why all work is not just toil. It's not fruitless, it's not meaningless. And work doesn't give us our identity. Work is the place we show up and become a different kind of person. St. Paul to the Colossians, he says, Whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as for the Lord. Whatever you do, there's no such thing as work that's beneath you. Whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as for the Lord. Because he's your audience. This is the last thing. There's a, there's a movie and a play called The Man for All Seasons about the life of St. Thomas More. And at one point, there's this man who comes up to, his name is Richard Rich. Um, and he wants to be really famous. He wants to be very powerful. He wants to be very influential. He wants to be a politician. And he thinks that if he gets close to St. Thomas More, that he's going to be on that track. And he says, Thomas, Sir Thomas, what should I do with my life? What should, what should I, what, where, what kind of area of, of work should I go into? And St. Thomas More looks at him and says, Richard, I think you'd be a good teacher. Richard says, a teacher? What good is that? He says, well, a person like you could, could educate people who need to be educated. You could care for people who need to be cared for. You could actually help people from going to this place of not knowing to a place of knowing. You could help people become the people they're meant to be. And Richard Rich stops and he says, but so what if I did? So what if I was great at this? Who would know? And St. Thomas More looks at him and he says, well, you would know. Your family would know. Your friends would know. Your students, they would know. And, and God would know. It's not a bad audience. 
Work is not a curse. We're made for work. There's no such thing as work that's beneath any of us. But it's that process of work. It's process of giving ourselves that transforms us into the people who are meant to be. Provided that, whatever we do, we work at with our whole heart as for the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much.